go ahead and take out a large sheet of paper, cause uh, you're gonna need all that space to keep track of all the things I might have done wrong. Be careful what you wish for. <sighs> Let's get started. Hi, and welcome to the third build. In the few days since I released my last video, others or myself have noticed something's wrong I either said or that the AI does, and I figured going over those mistakes is the best use of our time. If you haven't seen that video, I recommend watching through this one first, that way you can know what's right going into it. There will also be a few updates on things I mentioned, as, well, every part where you saw my face was filmed two months ago meaning that there's a lot that has changed and a lot that I've learned. So let's go over them. All right, what's up first? Really, this was only 30 seconds into the video and there's already a mistake? Gotta love it. So the problem here is with the most important number of them all, how many different ways a Pokemon battle can start. This one I had to calculate myself and what it represents is how many unique team combinations are possible between both sides of the field. In short, that number is found by finding all the unique variations of each Pokemon and then finding all the ways you can choose those variants for a team of six. These are the attributes which make a Pokemon noticeably unique in battle. If you want to dive into the math of how all of this worked, the code I used to compute this number is linked in the description and I might do a whole video on it because it's surprisingly not that straightforward. But we're here to talk about my mistake with the levels. The number should be easy to handle as it's normally just 1 through 100 or if the Pokemon evolves into themselves at a particular level, it's just that level through 100. Basically, we want to consider all the levels you can possibly find them while playing the game normally. However, in the games, there are cases where Pokemon appear at too low of a level, the most infamous being Champion Lance having a Dragonite 5 levels before it would normally evolve. Because of that, I made the choice of finding this number assuming any Pokemon could be any level. Turns out, this was a classic example of cherry picking data which just might be the most dangerous thing you can do in science, partly because you can do it by accident. I went into this thinking that this low level situation probably happened all the time, but if I had done a little more research, I would have found that the reason this Dragonite is the most famous case is because it's one of two cases. Now that I've changed the code to handle the levels properly, let's see what our new number is. Oh, it hardly changed a thing. This number is so big that dividing each Pokemon's possible options by at most, what, 60 wasn't going to change that much. So it was a harmless mistake, but one I should have avoided nonetheless. On to the next one. I didn't say this directly in the video, but it can be inferred that the machine learning model type that I use for making the predictions is a neural network, as that's the model I was trying to describe using this animation. One of the greatest strengths of these models is you can give it inputs without any context of where they come from, and it can give you a reliable answer. Although, when making predictions about your opponent, context to how the battle arrived at this point is everything, because you gotta factor in how your opponent played in the past. You can set up ways to factor that in with neural networks, but it tends to get far messier than it's worth, which means I was wrong in suggesting that this model type was the way to go. As for what model to use instead, well, I never found the answer. But that's because I stopped looking and I'll get to why at the end. The only reason I stuck with them is because it was working, which does bring in the question whether or not it was the wrong choice. But they were certainly not the best choice and continuing to use them was probably a mistake once I learned I could be using something better. The next mistake was one someone pointed out to me just as the video went out. However, it was actually intentional and might have been done for the better, but for the sake of completeness, I want to cover it. This error has to do with the graph for how many users have a certain rating, which was not done two months ago as I wanted this part to be accurate within a couple of days of uploading. You might notice the ratings start at 1005 rather than the actual rating of new users on Showdown of 1000. When I add 1000 back in, you can see the decision leaves a large portion of the players off the graph entirely. I did that because when I looked closer at the data of who all those players were, it became clear the 1000 rating was full of noise of people who use the system once and then never come back. It just felt disingenuous to have them in my findings, especially since having all those players at the bottom would push my AI into a higher percentage of player than it would have deserved. So I'm gonna stick by this choice and I'm happy to hear your opinions on it as well. Now this one is the biggest problem with the AI itself. I was curious to see if anyone would notice that the AI has a terrible tendency of, let's say, getting all the way to the end of a game, looking like it has an easy path to victory for two turns, and then letting its win chance disappear over the next four. 
In sports, one would say that the AI has a choking problem. This is a huge problem because when I look through the logs of all of its past losses, I find that a third of them are because it chokes. Obviously, fixing this is my number one priority, but it's such a complex problem to fix because it's caused by a little bit of everything. There's no ignoring that despite my best efforts, this AI has a ton of hidden bugs I haven't caught. And at the end of a battle, small mistakes have big consequences. If any small part of the code goes wrong, this mistake is magnified by missing out on making the right choice and then its win chance plummets. This next mistake is caused because I misspoke. During the inverse damage calculation part, I said this method could be used to know your opponent's stats for sure. Those last two words are the issue, as no matter what you do, your answer is still kind of a guess. Almost every move can do one of 16 randomly chosen amounts of damage. So there's no way of knowing if the move that was just hit was the most, least, or anything in between damage possible with their stat. But as you land more hits on them and them on you, you'll have calculated their stat enough times that the average of all of them will lead you close to the right answer. So that covers all the problems. And now I want to update you on something. Near the end of the video, I mentioned how there's a new part of the program, I creatively called thinking sideways that allowed the AI to not use the machine learning at all. Well, because it has been two months since I said that, I've had plenty of time to put how that works into better words. Basically, the models will learn how to weigh the importance of certain factors of a battle on a format basis, and then those weights were used for every battle. That's fine, as it gives you a general idea of how important things are, but with a game that varies as much as this one from battle to battle, those values being static could result in misguided decisions. For example, in the general case, laying down spikes of the opponent's side of the field is a good strategy so they can take damage any time they switch in. So, the machine learning models will suggest doing that will improve your chance to win. But, if all the opponent's team can fly over those spikes, laying them down will just be a waste of time. To fix this, I wrote code that can analyze the battle on its own, which resulted in similar behavior to if the models calculated those weights on the fly. It no longer understood the game on a format by format basis, but rather on a turn by turn basis. The code allows it to be far more dynamic in its analysis of the game and therefore improve its predictions. And because information about the battle no longer had to go through the machine learning TensorFlow pipeline, it could skip a large part of its speed bottleneck and be way faster. So that's everything I wanted to cover, and again, if you haven't seen the previous video, I would highly recommend doing so, and I'll see you later.